Hello, this is Dr. Stephen Lawson at Marshall University, and today I'm doing a session that I'm calling From the Mellophone to the Horn and Back Again. There's just some things about playing these two instruments that are different, but very often in a lot of school situations, um, the same people are playing the mellophones and the marching band that are playing a horn in uh, bands and orchestras and doing solo work. This is an old mellophone. Back in the day when I was a student, this is what they looked like. Now they're bell front, but they work the same way. Uh, the length of a horn, this is the F horn, single F horn is about 12 feet in length, and the mellophone is about six feet in length. So that's the reason why instead of having uh, horn fingerings that we use, we need to do trumpet fingerings. These old kind were set up so that the bell went in the other hand and you did the fingerings with your right hand. So most mellophones are still set up to be fingered with your right hand. And uh, there are such things as marching horns, but they're the same length as a horn, so they're heavier and more challenging to play. Um, one of the other differences is that with the horn, we use our hand in the bell as a tuning mechanism. But these are set up so that if you use your hand in the bell, it actually plays out of tune in some notes. So we actually just hold on to the bell. Uh, when horn mellophones were shaped like this, they were also called peck horns because they would play all the, those marches where you would just play afterbeats. Um, I think getting to play melodies occasionally, or at least good counter melodies, makes these much more useful in today's groups. But at any rate, um, here is a traditional mellophone mouthpiece, and here is a horn mouthpiece with an adapter. These little adapters give you the option to play with a horn mouthpiece. Um, here I have a Kelly mouthpiece, one of these plastic mouthpieces. And uh, the reason that I like these, particularly for marching, is that uh, they don't change with the temperature. So if it's really cold outside, uh, you have to go put a metal mouthpiece to your face. It's really uncomfortable, and you probably won't like it very much. Um, and they do make mellophone mouthpieces in plastic as well. They're about $30. Um, what? Now, just the shape of this, it's a little bit wider around the rim. If I hold them up so that you can see the rim, you can see that it's a little bit wider which allows you to get a little bit more of your face, your lip inside the mouthpiece, so it's a little bit more of a cushion. So if you're walking around playing, um, that helps to have a little more space for your face. Um, but at any rate, these are my first notes of the day. <laughs> there was a whole repertoire of solo pieces that pe uh, people played on these, uh, and they may say alto horn on them. The alto horn is the same length of instrument, but it's made so it goes bells up uh, like a euphonium, and uh, it's like a small version of the tuba family, and these were played quite a bit in uh, British brass bands. If you ever see a brass band playing, the smallest instruments that uh, are in the shape of a tuba or a euphonium are actually alto horns. And um, it's just a different shaping of, of the same length of tubing. But there was a whole lot of solo repertoire written for them, similar to the Arbins and Clark, uh, Herbert L. Clark, 
uh, a lot of the same things we just transcribed for mellophone or alto horn. So, um, fingers on the right hand, same as the trumpet, and you're all pretty aware of, of that, I'm sure. If you're, if you're getting to play horn in your bands, you're probably playing mellophone for marching, but they have pistons, so uh, pretty easy maintenance in terms of oiling them. You just unscrew and then put some oil down the sleeve and put it back in and you're good to go. Uh, so easy maintenance. I would recommend that uh, with your mellophones, you actually use a mellophone mouthpiece. It will be more comfortable and it will um, make the instrument better in tune. Not that great intonation is usually associated with uh, mellophones, but that's part of the reason why. I think if you play with a for real mellophone mouthpiece, it will help. And yes, it's different than your horn mouthpiece, but it's a small difference and you, you'll get used to it very easily. If I'm playing on a mellophone mouthpiece, I want to square up my lips very much as if I were playing a trumpet or a trombone. Can't see with my fingers in the way, but half and half. Um, and for a horn mouthpiece, I'll just use this one because it's handy here. You want to get used to a difference. You really need more top lip inside than bottom lip. So if you set the rim where the flesh of your lip meets the flesh of your face, it's interesting. You can actually hear a different tone to the buzz, uh, but that's that's the setup. So on the horn, we have kind of a built-in embouchure visualization visualization tool. So I can take this, and you can see my embouchure. I'll move closer. Not that it's such a great view, but so you can see. Tip it. And then if I go to play that on a horn mouthpiece, do the same thing. All right, so we want more top lip in for playing the horn. That's the difference when we talked about the hand. So going in with the hand on the far wall of the bell, so it should not be this way. This is the mellophone position because you don't need it for tuning. Here, you're, you're needing it for tuning. We do fine tune things with our hand all of the time. Uh, there was an occasion where I went to a horn workshop and took the students and uh, we got there at the last minute before the opening concert, uh, which was the American Horn Quartet, and uh, we got there just in time. And uh, so we ended up sitting in the front row, which sounds like a bad thing, but they were the only seats left in the auditorium. And we were sitting so that the, we could all see their bells. When the concert was over, the students remarked to me how much they saw them using their hands and the bell uh, for tuning. So it's one of the things that horn players need to be able to do. It also gives a more characteristic sound of the horn. Fingerings are approximately an octave um, above what the fingerings would be. If I want to finger the low C octave, those trumpet fingerings work, but in the, our normal octave range, we don't need all those third finger notes. And it's good to learn to use your double horn too because it makes the higher notes easier. Um, be glad to send you fingering charts should you need such things. Uh, so one of the things 
that's different with these is we have rotary valves. And the rotary valves, you want to put oil under the caps. So if I unscrew this cap, there's a spot right here that I want to put some oil. And um, there's another crease here in the back that is a really handy spot. I don't know if you can see, but it's right on the back of that stem. There's a little crease between the screw and where the valve connects. Uh, you should put a drop of oil there as well. And you should also put valve oil down the slides. Um, now, in terms of the oils that you use, under the caps, you can use that key and rotor oil that music stores always want to sell for horns because they think that's all we use. If you use key and rotor oil exclusively, you will probably end up with very slow gummy valves and then it won't work so well. So you want to use, uh, I actually use valve oil for everything. Um, it's considered a closed system, so you don't need to maybe oil as often as trumpet players. Trumpet players get in the habit of oiling every day. Um, so we don't, probably once a week, if you go around and do slides, caps, and the back uh, with valve oil, that would be fine. Um, if you have a horn that makes a lot of clicking sounds, that's when you want to start using the key and rotor oil under the caps and in the back. But always down the tubes, use the valve oil. Now what happens often in school situations is uh, during marching season, which may start in late spring, run through the summer, and most of the fall until football season is over and people are getting ready for the Christmas concert or fall concert, uh, the horns have been sitting in a closet for a long time. And so people, first thing, will take the horn out of the case and, oh, gee, my valves are stuck. And so they press down as hard as they can to get them loose and often will break strings. Um, so to avoid this, there's a trick. And if you know that a horn is going to be sitting for a long period of time, what you want to do is take the valves out and instead of putting valve oil down them, put in that key and rotor oil or household oil or uh, Marvel mystery oil or Dura Lube or, you know, some people use gun oil. Anything that is a medium weight oil. Um, so valve oil is very light. Any of the things, products I just mentioned are uh, medium weight oils, uh, which is still less than your 10W30, less than your car oils, but still. At any rate, you put that medium weight oil down in the valves and kind of work them a little bit. Yeah, they'll be slow and gummy, but over the course of that long period of time, they'll, uh, when you pick the horn back out of the case, they'll, they'll be slow and gummy, but they won't be stuck. You won't have broken strings. So that way you, you can quickly pour valve oil back down in there and flush all the, the slow stuff out and they'll, they'll come alive again in, in a very short uh, bit of time and then you'll be good to go. So keeping track of how you're oiling instruments, particularly if they're going to sit for a long time, you want to put the heavier oil in the valves, through the slides, and then when you come back uh, to playing the horn, it'll work. It won't stuck and you won't have to deal with broken strings. Um, some of the horns that I have have had the same string on them for way more than 20 years. So at any rate, you come back to the mellophone. And this mellophone's kind of cool in that it, um, it's set up an F now because that's what modern mellophones are. <laughs> Historically, these were in E flat, and this one comes with crooks so that you can change the length of tubing.
using the same, the fingerings would be a step lower. <laughs> This particular one has crooks to also go into C. So these old historic mellophones are kind of fun. There's a much longer tube. Put this in. This also has slides that you use to tune it. So I, I need to replace this first slide. Good reason to keep your slides working um, to play in this key and pull this out. Well, it's not going to, but. <laughs> play in C, it can play in E flat, which is the historic mellophone key, or it can play in F, the modern key. Uh, apparently, in the olden days, band directors really liked this instrument because they could just change crooks and play with any instrument. Um, so that's a round from mellophone to horn and back again. I hope that uh, those of you who are in that situation will try some of these things out and make your playing a little more fun and just keep playing. It's been a tough year with all of the pandemic and trying to keep things going, but things are going to come around. Um, there's always a need for horn players at the university level, and it's a good way to get some scholarship. Uh, if you want any information on that further, please let me know. Um, you can contact me at Lawson39 at marshall.edu. Love to hear from you. Thanks for checking us out today. Bye.